as we get started, folks, this is about Daniel Troyer's success of growing heirloom tomatoes in a greenhouse on a commercial basis. What I mean by that, a small farm attempting to have an income for him and his family right on the farm. And this is a pretty neat story, not because of Daniel Troyer or because of Midwest Biosystems or because of humus, liquid humus extract. All of those factors are included, yes. But this story, more than anything else, is about the fact that we are looking at some principles. Some of what you will hear today share some things Muted. that will help you understand <clears throat> that we did not actually do learn everything we should have learned for the last 30 years. In a, in a very neat way, this is showing that we at Midwest Biosystems, and myself included, have been somewhat oblivious to what was obvious to us all these years. So in a, in a sense, it's uh, showing up our ignorance. In a sense, it's showing up our blind blindness in parts of the past. But you're going to learn the principles of the multiple applications on this call that I think can be brought into broad acres. Um, some of it cannot relate in a sense, but I would argue that there's so much you can learn principle-wise. If I can say it this way, there are certain personalities that cannot get past the details and see the bigger picture. And I hope to help those as well. You are all needed. Every one of us is, the big picture folks and the ones that that uh, look at the details, we do have to do both. And you're going to find a curious, wonderful mix with Daniel and his story. And so with that, I'm going to start out. Uh, Daniel Troyer comes from Carbondale, Illinois. And he called in and said uh, to our staff here at the office, our support team, I'd like an hour's worth of, of Edwin's time. Can I have some consulting with him? And so they gave him uh, a time frame the following week, and so we had an hour. And what was interesting, he had a lot of questions. He started firing me, uh, and I'd answered them the best that I could, and I finally said, okay, what are you observing? Um, I was trying to answer his questions, but I was keenly aware that something's pro provoking this. He was fairly animated and excited. And I was happy and glad uh, my son Travis was working with him uh, in the previous times. I had known that. But uh, once we got to uh, having him share his story, I think he spent a good part of that hour. Instead of me teaching him, he was teaching me. And I, I was very grateful for that and, and asked later, Daniel, would you mind sharing your story at large? This story is much greater than Daniel, much greater than growing toma heirloom tomatoes in greenhouses. It's, it's about the tools that we have of God's creation and the magnificent results that come out of that. I, I would really like to sh have someone share this uh, uh, to others. This is a recorded call for the sake of passing this on. And we will be transcribing the call to the best of our ability. So it'll be in a printed form as well. And so, Daniel, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? That's very good, Daniel. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start out by, by asking you just a few questions. So we'll start out about this just plain and simple. How did you hear about humus protein? And would you mind just kind of step back and reflect on how this evolved for you and when i i actually think i heard the first time i heard about humus extract was uh well that, that's a little harder to answer edwin but i i guess i'll have to go back about a year ago when i actually first used humus extract and i think it might have been through a teleclass somebody telling me about the teleclass how long ago did you start your teleclasses? Actually, 
had a series of them, a fair amount of them, uh, five, six, seven years ago, and then we actually didn't start up again. We had a, a low where we didn't do very many, and so we started up much more of them just about a year ago, and so that's probably what so that, started. With that this. might have been little, what little that might have been what true. Yeah, a little more than a year ago. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's probably. I mean, I if if I remember correctly, that was probably the first time I've ever heard about humus extract or humus compost is through a teleclass. Somebody telling me about it, and I called in and listened to it. So and then I've I've never taken part in an actual live teleclass. I just seemed to work better for me to listen to the recordings. So I've I think I've listened to most of your recordings. That answers your question on that. No, it does. Thank you for thank you for mentioning that. Um, when you used a little bit of liquid humus extract, uh, uh, when was that specifically, and how? What were your reflections about it, et cetera? Okay, when I the first time I've used humus protein or extract compost is uh, was a year ago. Uh, last uh, my last not this current growing season, but a, a, the last growing season, I actually used humus protein in my stock tank throughout that season, and that's where I first learned about how humus protein can help us control pH in our grow media. And we did have a very good growing year, uh, not maybe not just a dramatic growing year, but we had a good solid growing year. Our our yield was up a little bit from the previous year. Uh, we and it really helped me control pH in my grow media. I couldn't quite explain that one, but I knew it was working. So stepping forward to this year, I decided to change a few things. Uh, did you want me to go on into this year's? I I do. I I would like for you to. Um... Did you have a com call with Travis even last fall? I'm not quite sure, but just just yeah, start I've, in I've late did, fall. I did yeah, I did yeah, I did have a few conversations with Travis. Travis was actually down to our farm one time. I I think he was maybe through the area and he stopped in and we had a conversation then, so uh that triggered some more interest. So moving forward, I decided that going into the new year, I was going to, in the way I start my seeds in a 50-count tray, that usually we put a cloth across, we, we put the seed into a 50-count tray, and then we put a cloth across the top of it. We water everything down, and we keep it at the correct moisture for germination. This year, instead of using the cloth, we decided we're going to get garden blend humus compost from Midwest and just put a real thin layer across the top of our seeds and keep that moisture at uh, the desired level because humus compost does hold moisture very, very well. It stays wet quite a long time. As long as there's moisture in that grow media, that humus compost kind of wants to pull it to the top. That was my experience with it. So it kept that seed at a very nice germination moisture. So that our seed actually sprouted through that humus compost. And from, from that time on, we started using N converter in our water that we were watering these little seedlings with, but we were not at that time using humus extract. My thinking was if I had N converter water and humus compost that we would be, we would have humus extract in, in the soil. So it was, seemed to be working good. Plants were growing nice. We had nice seedlings going into the greenhouse in January. So we kept on doing what we do in the greenhouse. We And then just before we put the seedlings into the greenhouse, we also took humus compost into our, our pots in the greenhouse. We actually grow in a bag culture. And I'll explain a little bit what that means. Bag culture means We've got a five-gallon pot of potting soil, and that that is considered a five-gallon pot, but it looks more like a three-gallon pot if you look at it. But it's considered a five-gallon pot, and we put two tomato plants per pot into that 
And just before we planted those tomato plants, we did put humus compost across the top of that potting soil and plant it into that. Then we put our irrigation needles into that soil and we started irrigating things. Again, we were using end converter, end converter through the drip. My thinking again was if we've got humus compost in the pot and we're using end converter through the drip irrigation with our fertilizer, we would technically have humus extract in the media. Uh, so we did load up the plants. We loaded those plants really heavy. We had a nice crop. I mean, we had big tomatoes. We had lots of tomatoes. I was happy with what everything looked like. Stuff was clicking along pretty good. We had nice sunshine. And then around the 1st of April, I noticed that we were just getting to the point where we were starting to ripen some stuff up. And this is always a high energy need right at that ripening time. So, and these plants were really loaded. I was happy. I mean, I was blown away with what my plants looked like. I was excited for this, this crop. But I did notice that we were running out of energy. And, and so I had a conversation with Travis and I was asking him about another product and he recommended that I would go with uh, humus extract. He, what Travis actually told me is if he'd be growing tomatoes, he thinks he would go get some humus extract and see what he could do with that to up the energy level on those plants. So I got off the phone and I told my wife, well, uh, maybe I should go spend the money. So I, I did. I, I went and I got some humus extract, 250 gallon tote of the plantinum plant-based humus extract, and we came home and I said, I sure hope it was worth it because uh, we spent some more money. So anyway, we, did I was you, listening to some of. Daniel, if I can interrupt just a little bit, did you mention that you decided you're going to go back and listen to some of the teleclasses to confirm this as you were agonizing on your decision? Yes. And then, then when I got home, I, I was trying to figure out why was Travis recommending humus extract. We've got humus compost and and in the in the soil we're we're using end converter. Why would humus extract make the difference? And and uh, so I I I listened to some of the the teleclasses recordings how plants grow better with humus and and by the way I I've listened to all of these before but in the course of a couple of days, I've listened to, and the three that really stood out to me was how plants grow better with humus compost, and then sun's energy and kilocalories, part one and part two. If you listen to all three of those and really listen to what Edwin is telling us, there's a lot in that. And then the, the final class that I hadn't listened to yet was on humus extract usage. I I wasn't able to listen to that one at that time, but anyway, so I decided that if this is actually what this product is that Edwin's telling us about, we're going to use humus extract every day. Everything we did in the greenhouse, we if we mix soluble fertilizer, we put humus extract and converter and then our soluble fertilizer. And we started spraying humus extract every morning in our greenhouse and every morning except for Sunday morning. We, we don't spray on Sunday morning. But in the course of three days, after three days, I could see at the very top of my plants that we were starting to move some things along again. Uh, the, the green color at the very top started changing just a little bit. And this is my tenth crop in the greenhouse. This is all I do six days a week for about six months out of the year. So I'm not saying that I know how to grow a tomato plant. I'm just saying I know what I want my tomato plants to look like. So the other thing we noticed after about two weeks was our soil up to coming into April, we've been irrigating these plants pretty heavily to keep this load bed and this potting soil was starting to tighten up. 
we were getting hard. And that concerned me a little bit, and yet just not. I mean, it's part of greenhouse growing in, in the media we grow in, something we face. Now, uh, we didn't have the pH problems as much this year as we've had other years. But when we started using humus extract, about going into week number three, I noticed that something is really changing in this potting soil. This settling of potting soil was starting to change. We actually started to come back up to the level that we started out with in the potting soil, which is amazing to me. And, I, and that's one thing that I couldn't figure out was why was this actually, I mean, when I took my finger and I was testing for EC in this potting soil, I, would, I used to have to really get in there. I'd have to dig to get my hand down into that potting soil because I don't want to just test the top. I want to test it all the way to the bottom. And now I could just wiggle my fingers in there and I'd, I'd be getting in there. It was, we had oxygen in that media which I knew that was a good thing, but my question was, why is it doing this? What's actually happening here? Now, so that, we were actually, well, three weeks, so we would have been at about 15 to 20 applications of humus extract in those three weeks, cutting out some of the weekend days that we didn't spray. So anyway, Edwin, do you have anything else you want me to cover? Yeah, I would like for you to uh, thank you for sharing that. I would like to have you expand on the fact that um, when you looked at your three days after was trying to recover in plants, what talk to us more about what you observe next and where this all went to knowing this kind of effort of, yeah, let's talk about what day did you start putting it on every day? And uh, what you had the first week and second week, if you don't mind, plant-wise, production-wise, et cetera. Okay, the, the first week we started putting it on, it was, well, I would have to turn back on my calendar here a little bit, but we had the eclipse on the 8th of April here. So on the 9th, I went and got my extract. So the 9th was actually the first day we applied some extract when I got my extract. So at, at, you, would, you could say April 10th was the first morning we actually started spraying. And we had a pretty good harvest week that week. We were moving along by that time, and we hit a pretty solid average on what we normally harvest in April on that week of the 8th to the 13th. Now, moving into the, and like I said, so we applied humus extract on the 10th, and by the 13th, I could see that we were getting some extra energy out of these plants. By Monday, which is the 15th, we were really getting some extra energy. Our ripening process really stepped up. And what I'm saying by ripening process, stuff was moving along, along really nice. And we had a big harvest week that week. And I'd like to stress this right here. When we're harvesting tomatoes like this, if we're if we get into heavy harvest and and we don't have enough energy for this plant, we get a huge dump off and then a big, big slump. Because what happens is the plant doesn't have enough energy to keep on growing. So it just dumps off what it can't handle and then you get a big slump. And so far we haven't had that. Uh, because we're able to keep that plant going. So what I saw is we, we upped our energy enough that we could ripen up stuff and keep our plant growing. And we really bumped that from 15th to 27th of April, even into the 30th. Our yields was, it just blew my mind away. 75% uh, more than we've ever done before, and this is going into the 10th year of our growing. So that was a pretty good hit. Obviously, this is not a done deal because we're not done with a year yet. Our plants still look really good. Uh, I am comfortable with sharing that, you know, humus extract really gave us a lot of energy there. And 
I've tried a lot of other things over the years doing that. Now, there's one question that I would like to ask Edwin. Edwin, where do you think we would be at if we decided to bring humus extract into our greenhouse on the 10th of April and do a, a two-week app, like say, we're gonna apply this every two weeks. We're gonna spray humus extract every two weeks and apply humus extract every two weeks into our grow media. Where do you think we would be at in this energy increase and loosening up my potting soil, getting some oxygen back into that potting soil? Yeah, that's a very good question. I appreciate you asking that, Daniel. And first of all, it is a little bit of a, can I say, egg on my face to have not emphasized the, the more applications, the better kind of a thing. But my answer is going to be couched in a concept of high intensive growing where you are putting on many applications a very small amount of fertilizers, et cetera, et cetera. And in that context, when you are in that intensive side of it, if you would have been using extract every two weeks, the slump that you were talking about that you had in previous years, it would have long gone into that. And really, quite frankly, the benefits you would have gotten would have been certainly improved from a year ago, but fairly nominal. What I'm trying to say is, is that every two-week application could have never brought in the amount of energy. And, and talk to us a little bit because I want you to emphasize that. Um, you know, you can put on fertilizer, you can flow your feed, you can do a lot of applications of that, but at some point, too many applications of that, even trace amounts of it, eventually you come up to kind of an, uh, can we say saturation point? Can we say a burning point? Would you comment about that? And then I'll finish my answer because that needs to be put into this answer. Okay, I am a, I am a, uh, I really like to grow crops. So I have tried a lot of different things for your applications and and if somebody tells me that I should full your app apply something every 10 days, I'm the type of God guy that will probably go in there and apply it every five days. So I have tried a lot of things that, and I've studied fertility intensely for the last 15 years, maybe even longer than that. And, and we've tried applying stuff every day. And I'm talking about synthetic fertilizers that are listed for foliar applications. And what we've found is you just can't get enough energy into a stressed plant. You can help things along a lot with foliar applications, but I'm talking about uh, if you've got a plant that's really, really stressed and you go in there that really needs some fertilizer, and you go in there with a fertilizer that that plant is short on, and I stand to be corrected in this, but that is short on, and you spray that on that leaf, you're gonna have to be really, really careful. I've had experience in this. I've done this many times. You will burn those plants, and, and you will actually do more damage than good in some situations especially in a greenhouse situation, our light intensity is very high. So we try to spray really early in the morning, and we've done a lot of foliar applications that have worked for us that I felt were, were good things, but we've never been able to really find something that we can go into a high stress period and just hit it every day and really up our energy to, to blow through that heavy load and that high stress period because what ended up happening, either our plants became vegetative or our nitrates went too high, our fruit quality started dropping. Uh, so in the past, what we've done is we've always sacrificed quantity for quality. And I will repeat that. We've, we were sacrificing quantity for quality. We accepted that if we really want to grow high quality produce, we're going to have to stay away from that very high quantity sometimes because we need to sacrifice some of that quantity in order to grow quality. 
What excites me is when I came in here with humus extract, it appears to me like I can give this plant enough energy to blow through that and grow quantity and quality. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> I've often said it absolutely makes sense. And I've often said, you know, we live in an and world. Let's have quality and yield. And uh, you just remind me of that in the sense that we really have a fortunate thing once we truly tap into God's creation and the tools God has given us to have some of this happen, frankly, is not so much about what was given to you. Yes, humus protein was given to you, but those are all things that came out of existing organic matter that had stored photosynthate in it that was reconverted to a humus protein that you are now talking about. How can this be? Well, it's sunshine directly into plants, and that sunshine is on, uh, can I say, turbocharged, if I can say that, uh, and that's what you're experiencing. And I like that. I'm, I'm, uh, I didn't get the chance to comment that I, I, I'm agreed with what Edmund said about this call. Uh, when we study fertility and the way a lot of this stuff works and we really get into sync with how God created the world and we study that, the closer we can imitate that, the more successful we're going to be. That's just, it's a rule of life. I mean, there's some foundational truth that the closer we can come to those foundational truths that God put in place when he created, it's just going to work a lot better in everything we do. Uh, we had the other day a, com a conversation, Daniel, I want to take very little time at this, but uh, we'd like to talk about being a biological acrobat and how this is taking this to the upper echelon by becoming much less of an acrobat and t totally depending more on God's creative powers. Uh, would you mind having a discussion about this? Sure. Um, I remember. That's fine. I remember back in the journey of learning uh, renewable farming systems, back in the journey of having graduated from seven and a half years worth of training and really quite being successful, I was bluntly told by some people that I was training under in Europe, and it was uh, fairly humbling, and it was kind of a two-by-four effect in a sense. I didn't take offense at it, but it was a knock on my head, so to speak. And it, when you're just learning to become a biological acrobat. I looked at him puzzled like, and says, what do you, what are you trying? Well, you do this, and then the plant responds. Then you do that, and then the plant responds. And pretty soon you're chasing yourself because you have one response that requires another support. You have another response that requires another support. And all of a sudden, you're almost chasing your tail, aren't you? And uh, they were trying to be gentle, but it was loud and clear what they were trying to help me with. And I looked at them and said, well, maybe I am, but is there a better way? And uh, you literally went down that same journey you shared with the other day where you have actually been taught a lot of valuable things because that, that taught me also a lot of valuable things. It wasn't actually all in vain by any stretch. you mind commenting about that? Sure. Uh, when we first started doing Greenhouse, I mean, I was totally new at this, and this was a new business, and so we uh, we did a lot of things. I mean, we put a lot of effort into learning how to grow a commercial tomato and, and being successful at it. And what I'm saying being successful at is supporting my family, making the payments, and and just doing what a farmer should do. Uh, one of the, the paths we went down is sap analysis. I'm not knocking sap analysis on the head, but when I when I after a couple of years of doing sap analysis, I finally described sap analysis to somebody like this. 
I said, sap, doing sap analysis on a tomato greenhouse crop is like putting a whole bunch of T posts out in a, in a little lot, just far enough apart that you can jump from one to the other. And you can put all kinds of names on those T posts. You can put zinc, you can put boron, you can put all the micronutrients on those. And, and whenever that sap analysis test comes back, you're trying to jump from that one to the next, trying to stay on top of each other. And you sure hope you don't miss when, or you don't hit the thing when you come down. And, and I wasn't saying that to be negative about sap analysis. I'm just saying in my experience, we were not able to go fast enough. And I could never, it's like I told Edwin one time, I do this for money. And, and that sounds greedy maybe, but it's still a fact in life. This is why we are in business, is to make money, to support our families so that we can survive. Money is a, is a necessary thing. But coming back to, to what I was saying is, I could never get a solid return on investment on what was this SAP analysis actually making. I think I've learned quite a few things in SAP analysis. I'm not saying it's a totally worthless thing, but I'm not a university. I'm not a, I don't do this for knowledge. I'm, I'm trying to make a living at this. And, and so, you know, sometimes we make those mistakes and it's not necessarily a wrong mistake. Sometimes we just have to back up and say, you know, this is not really working. That was just, uh, I might have to do something a little differently. And I don't think those mistakes are all wrong. Maybe Ava can, can correct me on that, but uh, that was part of my journey. And it's probably a learning curve in every business. And that's not saying that we've really learned how to do this now either. That's not what I'm saying, because we're still going to make mistakes, and we're going to have to figure out, you know, what what can we do differently here? Uh, Edwin, do you have anything else to say to that? <laughs> that is good. There are many more things. I, for time's sake, have to move on to the last two pieces, and then I want to open it up to some of our support members that want to either question, have questions for you or comments. So the two more pieces that we need to talk about in, the, in this call is let's talk about production and then let's talk about market. Uh, and I'm talking market as in your philosophy of able to command the prices that it requires for it to be sustainable, but also for it to be workable for the buyers. So let's start with your production. You commented about uh, the month of April over the last nine years has kind of given you a good baseline. And this year, you're 75% higher yield. Um, okay, let's in... back up on that one a little bit, Evan. Sure. Uh, on that 75%, <clears throat> I was actually looking at sales. So we did have a price increase in that. So. Let's say we're 50% higher in poundage. Is that fair? And, yeah. And I think that's I think that's being that's shooting it. I know that shooting it under what we actually did. But got it. I I, I just don't want to. I'm I'm just saying we had a very good return on investment. Is that fair? Nope. That's that's absolutely fair. I missed one piece, and that's talking about the fact that when you started using the humus extract on a daily basis, what happened to your fertilizer uh, uh, applications? Did you not reduce them and how that related to paying for the uh, humus extract? We should probably do that next. And then then I wanna look at storability or shelf life and, and hardness of your tomato before we get to the market. We did have, we did have a reduction in fertilizer usage. Uh, we've got a way that we watch that testing ECs and different things like that. So we are actually using less fertilizer, using the humus extract. Now it's a little bit hard for me to put a percentage on that because we're not done. Or we're still in our growing season. So we're still tracking that one, but we are definitely using less fertilizer than we were. Humus extract seems to make it more uh, efficient 
I guess you could say. Very good. Thank you for that. And it, the, the story is out then as we go forward, you know, has the Humus Extract been able to pay its own way into this program that you currently have, which obviously is an intensive program at, at the very least? The way it looks right now, Humus Extract is by far the best return on investment we have ever done in my greenhouse. So you are past wondering if you did the right thing of getting 250 gallon. Is that what you're saying? Notice I've got a grin in my voice. I've actually, since I've gotten that 250 gallons, went and bought another thousand. So if that answers your question, I guess that's enough said. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes humor helps lighten the day, and it sure did this time. Thank you. I would like to talk about shelf life. Um, maybe okay. wait, Maybe start with the density, weight per tomato, to, those kinds of thoughts. Maybe that. And that was there. something that contributed to our yield increase was tomatoes that we thought were going to weigh eight and nine ounces. You know, we were getting into that 12 to 15 ounces. Stuff was silaging up really good. Density was very good. And density equates to shelf life. The other thing that we've noticed is our heirlooms have very good color. Uh, Color is something that can be a little bit of a challenge in a greenhouse situation on heirloom tomatoes because color, your nutrient density and color goes hand in hand. If your nutrient density goes up, usually the color intensity goes up with it. That's, that's a rule of life in heirloom tomatoes. So if you've got a really dense heirloom tomato, it usually tastes a little better, has better color, and it also has better shelf life. That's some of the positives we've seen this year. And that's there's one thing I do want to repeat, Edwin, is in the past, we have always focused on quality. So we we have been able to grow a, a fairly nice heirloom, even a fairly nutrient-dense heirloom, because we were willing to sacrifice quantity for quality. Does that make sense? Yep, it certainly does. Thank you for bringing that into context. I I do appreciate that. And yet, this fact still remains what you expected to be a 9 ounce, sometimes was a 12 or up to even 15 ounces in weight, uh, as opposed to previous years, right? Right. Thank you for sharing that. Just a little bit about uh, markets of what you've been able to experience. There'll be some people wondering, are you going to a produce uh, uh, auction? Uh, what's happening? So can you just explain a little bit? Do two things here. Explain side-by-side uh, -side comparisons on the shelf of what the differences are in percentages in costs for the, for the shoppers, talking in the store, as well as just, just where you come from in, um, and we know that at the end of nine years, that story is completely different than it was at the end of one year. So we have to keep that also in context here. So just not very much, but just a few minutes. Okay. So the way we do our marketing, we've never went to produce auctions because we're not close enough to produce auctions to sell to a produce auction uh, to really even make it feasible. So when we started our business, we were selling to a a big chain operation. That was our first goal when we started this business. Now, that eventually our markets differentiated from that because of different reasons, and I'm not going to go into that. So the, we sell to uh, a restaurant broker is a buyer that sells a lot of uh, our product, and obviously restaurants are more of a high-end uh, he sells quite a large percentage of our tomatoes, and then we have a couple stores that sell tomatoes for us, and we and these are high-end stores. So we sell everything directly off of the farm. I don't deliver any tomatoes to anybody, and I've got a really good team of people that sell tomatoes for me. Uh, 
and I feel I'm very thankful for that. It took it took quite a few years to get to the point where we're at now, and that's something that's really important when we're selling local produce. And some of these produce stands or stores that have got my tomatoes in there, I've walked into their stores and they've actually had other tomatoes that were shipped in right price. And I ask them, how does this work? How are you selling this expensive tomato right beside the other one? Obviously, mine had a lot more color. They were fresh right off the line, so the color was very intense. And and the guy looked at me and he says, that helps sell your tomato. So I was like, wow, that's that's pretty impressive. So when we put a tomato into a store, wherever we're at, we're trying to produce a tomato that really has a good taste. We want people to remember that taste so they come back to that tomato every day. And and our brand, that tomato in, in a few of the stores that we sell in, uh, so people remember that brand from one year to the next. And I I never look at other produce growers as my competition. As far as I'm saying, local produce will always sell itself if we're doing a good job growing it, if we're doing it long enough. Obviously, I don't care who you are. If you go into a business and you're going to be successful at it, you're probably going to have some growing pains getting there. That's just the way it is. And I don't look at, at shipped-in produce as my competition. When we look at pricing on food, like say we go to Walmart and we buy packaged food. I look at junk food as my competition. There's all kinds of opportunity in America today to sell fresh local produce for five and six dollars a pound. We just need to get the word out there that people really need to eat this. When we look at who's buying this produce for five and six dollars a pound, it's not necessarily always wealthy people like people think. Sometimes it's just successful people that are buying. And why are they successful? Are they are they buying produce because they're successful or are they successful because they have chosen a good lifestyle and good eating habits? So that's always the way I look at when I'm marketing produce, and we need to get five or six dollars a pound so everybody involved, the marketer, the grower, can make a good profit and be sustainable. In order to be sustainable, we have to make enough money to feed everybody involved, including the buyer that's buying this produce. But when we look at what low-end people are eating, and I'm not saying low-end people. I shouldn't say it that way. There's nothing like low-end people. When I'm, I should say low-income people. When we look at what low-income people are eating in America today, a lot of this food that's being bought, McDonald's, whatever, they're paying at least 5 to $6 a pound for the food they're eating. And if we look at 5 to $6 a pound coming off the farm, we can do that. We can feed these people very nutritious food, and we could change their lifestyle. What we need to do is get the message out there that this food is available, and we need to figure out a way to sell to these people. Wow, that's profound. Thank you for sharing. Daniel, it's time I open it back up to the several con contributors for this call. It could easily last another half an hour beyond, but we are going to shut it down. So unfortunately, this will have to be maybe shorter than before, but we'll certainly entertain more questions. Uh, it is uh, based on popular demand. We may have another uh, question and answer period, uh, even in a different teleclass. Uh, our team is looking at that potentially, but I'd like to call upon several people. I'm going to start in. I'm uh, going to talk about micro leverage. Some of our human centers are on here as well as some of our customers. Um, micro leverage has got Gene, Jim, and Robert Krupp. Uh, they, any of them can speak up. They may or may not. It's fine either way. Uh, the next names I want to announce is Jonathan Keller and his uncle Gerald Keller. I would like to announce uh, Daryl Mason from Virginia, Aaron Burkholder, my sons Todd and Travis. There may be some others that I am forgetting. Uh, if there are, they're going to announce their first name, and I'll then do finish the introductions. But honestly, we can't include all of them in this. I apologize up front because of our limited time. And thank you, Daniel, for sharing it. I felt like it needed to be more comprehensive as we went through this. So with that being said, uh, who would like to take 
the first uh, opportunity to either ask Daniel a question or a comment on what Daniel had shared. Uh, go ahead, uh, Jonathan, do you have anything? Um, right. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on Daniel's comment yeah, about... This, this, this is Jonathan. Always just start with your first name. Thank you. That's fine. Uh, yeah, this is Jonathan Keller. And uh, I'd like to comment on uh, Daniel's comment about fertilizer and being a challenge to when you're in production in uh, full production mode to not overdo it and to still get that plant setting fruit even while you are harvesting fruit and you know, not to burn the plants and the ability to do that with the regular regular applications of liquid humus and in reality what he's what he's saying there is the liquid humus allows the plant to perform according to its ability. So a plant, a healthy plant, always has the ability to set fruit and harvest fruit at the same time. Do most plants? No, but a healthy plant can. So liquid humus facilitates that and increases the ability to harvest sun energy. So what he's doing is really just increasing the natural processes in the both in the plant and the soil. That's it's something that I guess really stood out to me as you were talking there, Daniel. Thank you for that, yeah, Jonathan. For the sake of time, I'll call on another one. Uh, how about you, Daryl? Your customer has something neat to share, but let's can keep it very short if we can. Go ahead, Daryl. Yes, uh, Edward. Sorry. This is Daryl calling. Or Matt. Yeah. Yep. Um, I would like to say that. I appreciate Daniel's time because I think it was a really good story. I think we all have a lot we could learn out of that. I yeah, have a cust customer on here named Myron Bowman, and I'm just going to have him tell about some of his experience with extract. Thank you for that. Go ahead, Myron. Uh, you may I, have to press... Yes, uh, you may have to press My, star one if you was muted. Go ahead, Myron. Yep, Myron. Myron Bowman here from Virginia. And early this year, we had a cover crack that was struggling to grow. So we mixed some extracts with some explorer 1010. Hey, Myron, Myron, can you get a little closer to your mic? We can barely hear you. better now yes much better thank you yep good so we um had some cover crop that was struggling um some agra kings um crazy winter mix and i needed more growth didn't so i put some mix extract with explorer 10 possibly a couple other items i can't remember exactly what it was now Yep, that was an amino probably, acid nitrogen. Yep, that's, that's correct. Ahead. Yep, and probably it was a 30 gallon acre rate and sprayed. And three weeks later, I would feel fairly confident to say that the biomass had doubled in the wow. cover crop. Wow, we're just really Thank pleased, you. really pleased with that. And not sure what all happened. It did warm up, did get a little rain, but I feel like that application did have a lot of impact yeah appreciate you sharing myron and for the others on the call myron is a uh, an awesome strawberry grower as well as other types of uh, produce not not at all just strawberries but uh, thank you for sharing myron was there any last thoughts myron before i switch to the next person um my, one thought one question i had for daniel i can't remember if he was putting extract through his drip or not but did he struggle with um did he have a greater filter than just a normal 
or was he did he have any concern or putting it through the drip or was he only spraying it that's been a great concern of mine trying to keep my emitters from plugging in my drip tape so that's that won't be the only question i had for him thank you for your effort okay i i was running it through the drip and i still am and the and the drip system we're using is actually a fairly complex system uh well, I'd say, I mean, it's not just a drip tape. It's a, it does have a little plug in it, so it snaps into it, and it's, it's not as easy to plug as like just a drip tape. But no, we have not had any problems plugging drip emitters. One thing I do, if I do see that the extract has a little bit of settling at the bottom, I will strain it through like a, uh, a cloth, and take some of that dirt back out of it. Uh, if I'm running it through the drip or something that I'm concerned about plugging, I don't want to. I want don't want any settling going into that. I do watch that a little bit, but not not just very much. I have not had trouble plugging it. No. Thank you, Daniel Good. and Myron. Myron, your contribution was very much valued. Uh, I have another gentleman, Aaron Burkholder. Would you uh, would you mind contributing? Have you got any questions or thoughts? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thanks. Thank you. I got a question for Daniel. Daniel, that was an, a very interesting story. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit uh, what your rates were of application of liquid humus? So, so you're putting it through how many gallons a day uh, equivalent uh, per acre um, do you... Okay, we're doing you're six gallons out? average per day, and that... Okay. And that equates to 18 gallons per acre if you're going to do it on an acreage basis. But it's like I've, it's like I've said in my situation, we don't look at acreage basis as much. But if you're comparing it to acreage basis, yes, that does come out to 18 gallons a day. Perfect. Thank you. And one more oh, last question. But the, the garden blend, I understood you put a little bit in your uh, grow pots there. How thick of a layer? Placing there um, around the tomato quarter inch, which is a lot. I'm sorry, I missed that number. That was uh, we had about a quarter inch on top of those quarter pots. inch. Gotcha. Perfect. Thank you much. That's all I have, Edwin. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, we'd like to simply say this: appreciate everyone that's contributing. And has I'd like to see if Gene or Robert or someone of Micro Leverage team has anything to offer. <clears throat> this this is Gene. Uh, I I was just going to ask the same thing Aaron asked, so that kind of kind of answered my question or my comment. Thank you, Gene. Appreciate you doing it. We've got one last person I'm going <clears> to <throat> single out, and that is Gerald Keller. Do you have anything to offer? Uh, yes, this is Gerald. I, I, I want to uh, affirm uh, Daniel, his experience and, and what he has shared, uh, because it it confirms what I'm experiencing in a little different way. But uh, one of the things that uh, we've experienced here in the last few weeks uh Someone was at our workshop that uh, went into the drone business, purchased a number of drones to uh, put out uh, <clears throat> chemicals and so forth. And he wanted to come to our farm and, and map one of our fields. It was uh, actually a problem field. And, and and they had showed me, I had uh, sat with them, they showed me how these drones work and 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 how they they map the field and and uh, every picture they showed me, the maps would show red areas that weren't doing well and yellow areas that were sickly and then some green spots that uh, were supposed to be healthy. And we started uh, this particular field in 2020 with the, the Humus Protein uh, Program. And when he came back with the map, 
Uh, and of course, they were they were touting this this business and how how wonderful it is because you can map your field and then put your fertilizer where you need it and save a lot of money. That's that's the whole premise of this whole thing. Well, when they mapped our field, there was it was basically all solid green. And and the principle there is that microbiology does not sit still, does not sit in one spot. You don't have several square feet of microbiology and then somewhere else it's absent. Uh, given time, and, and like I say, it's uh, we're looking at four years now, but given time, microbiology moves from the healthy to the unhealthy. Whereas in, in, in commercial production, commercial soils, where you put the fertilizer is where it stays. And, and so you have good spots and bad spots. And, and I've been intrigued with that, that concept and uh, so I, I could appreciate, uh, Daniel, what you shared about sap analysis and, and the illustration of all those stakes. When we focus on soil biology, uh, this, the, that, that microbiology takes care of the whole field. Yeah. No, I appreciate you saying that. Thank you for contributing, Gerald. Uh, I would like to make two comments about Gerald's, just as an addition to Gerald's comments. Microbiology moves, but adding photosynthate protein to the leaf structure, even in the bad fields, stimulates the roots, and the roots literally repair the land. Those are also phenomena there. There's one last piece, and then I'm going to close out this call. I forgot to mention my sons, Todd or Travis. Any one of you did, if you have something to contribute, I apologize to you. This is Travis. Uh, I had a question for clarification from Daniel. Was this mostly the six gallon that you were putting on per day? Was that mostly foliar or how much of that was split between foliar and the drip? We were doing around two gallons a day full year, and then the other three gallons were going into the stock tank. Okay. For, for, Thank you. for his drip, yeah. Very good. Well, again, uh, uh, let me see if Todd's still on. I'm not sure if he has anything to ask. Nope, I, this is Todd here. Nope, I think my questions have been answered uh, from what Aaron and... Uh, Travis is now asked again. Thank you for contributing, Todd. He's uh, in charge of our manufacturing. In fact, they're loading trucks in a big way. So it's even a wonder he was able to respond. And there's many more on this call that could have responded. And I thank each one of you. Uh, time has ran out. We are going to shut this call down. I have a deep appreciation for not only the people that spoke, but the people that listened, the ones that dialed in. Yeah, we had quite a few people on this call. Thank you so much. And uh, again, stay tuned. We may actually have just uh, an additional F and Q on this uh, call, et cetera, later, because I feel like we've uh, shut this down before we really wanted to. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, and God bless you all.